All right, cool. I think we're on. Right on. Yeah, I'm not sure. Oh yeah, cool. I can see attendees like popping up. Amelia, Carly, Martin, Fisher, and Michelle Petty. I don't know how to say it nicely. <laughs> cool. This is going to be fun to watch people jump on here a couple minutes early. So I guess we can just chit chat as people join on. And I guess they're seeing us and hearing us, but we don't get to see them back. So this is going to be interesting. <laughs> can you see the attendees on your end, Andy? Yeah, that's what I was looking at. Yeah, cool. So what did you do for your Memorial Day weekend? Uh, well, uh, with the home dynamics for Angie and I, we work um, every day of the week. So we, uh, she works in the morning and I work in the afternoons. And uh, our one thing that was out of the normal was Matthew's birthday was our daughter uh, turned five on Saturday. So oh, that we had, uh, yeah, we had a, uh, a different version of a birthday for a five-year-old. Yeah. Did you have any family or friends over or is it, you're still being really careful about that? Uh, we're generally being uh, pretty careful about that, but uh, we met with some friends from some family on the porch and, and visited and we did a uh, Zoom call with them. It was great. She had a good time. That's awesome. Very good. Yay. Well, happy birthday to Matthew. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, this is great. I can see we've got 14 attendees. You guys, we're just kind of going to chat here for a couple minutes if you're just joining in. Um, it's only 5.59, so I think we'll give everybody a couple minutes to get on here before we really get digging into these wines. In the meantime, I'm, I'm smelling this wine and enjoying this rosé, so that's good. Yeah, and Mike and I, um, as I told you, Andy, we went over to Eagle Crest with the kids um, Friday. We left Friday and I uh, did some work Friday afternoon. Mike did too. We both had business calls Friday afternoon. So we left in the morning, got there and then worked in the afternoon and then um, spent Friday night and Saturday and Sunday really just kind of chilling out in Central Oregon. We mostly did some fishing two nights down in the Deschutes, um, bike rides. I picked up a new bicycle, a used bicycle, but a new bicycle for myself and Ben, which was kind of fun. I've been watching Craigslist. Um, so we kind of, you know, breezed over to grab that while we could. And just kind of like had a good time chilling out with the family. We've had so much like downtime with the family. It's been good. Yeah. So it was nice to get out of the house. I can say that. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. Right on. I love yeah, Central exactly. Oregon. Yeah, me too. It was great to get over there. Gorgeous blue skies. Only this morning it was a little bit cloudy in the morning, but then it broke up and it was sunny and awesome. So yeah. And then today, interesting weather, right? It was like when we got here, it was sunny. And now it's like just gray and kind of overcast has come in. Is it like that? In yeah. Washington? Yeah, it's been drizzly and uh, oddly kind of warm and muggy, but drizzly uh, all day. Yeah, yeah. Weird. <laughs> it's just it's that's the outlier in the next 10 days. I think it looks like the weather is going to be pretty good going. Uh, I guess it's on and off, but yeah, yeah. That's, that's May. It's not so bad. Totally. looks really warm on Friday or Saturday, I think, right? It's coming up to like 80 or something. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely going to start warming up soon. Good. Good, good. We have 18 people here. Look at all these names. This is super fun. I'm looking to see if there's many people I recognize. Glad to see you guys all jumping on here. We're just trying to kill a few minutes because we're waiting for everybody to join on before we get really into this too much. Um, I don't know, it's 601. I guess we should probably kill another minute or two and let people jump in. Um, 20 people, yeah, they're still coming. So I think we had like 30 people, maybe a little more than that, RCP'd. So um, some people will probably just be jumping in as we go. So we won't wait forever for everybody. And I'm sure some people, you know, got distracted. You just never know what came up with their Memorial Day day. So I might give them a few minutes. Right on. It's, well, it's I'm gonna be- It's great to see so many familiar names lining up. I wish mm -hmm. that uh, we had the bandwidth for everybody, uh, everybody's faces on there, but uh, it's great to see all your names and uh, getting so, so much more familiar with each wine club that we have. Um, I'm hoping that there's some new faces, uh, some new names out there and some that these wines are new to a handful of you. It'd be exciting to talk about uh, some new topics. Yeah, actually that's a really good fun thing. If you're a new wine club member or like haven't met Andrew and I, you could use that chat function and say, hey, and then we'll know to look out for you at least here anyway. We can virtually meet even though we can't meet in person until the next wine club event. <laughs> or maybe you're from far away and won't make it ever. So this will be a new way to connect on ongoing. That's really cool too. 
So we've got 23 people. I think Andy, maybe just kind of jump in and we're just going to yeah. kind of chat as we go and make it, you know, interactive and interesting. And if people jump in late, that's okay. I think we'll just give a tiny bit of housekeeping up front. Um, so obviously you can't, we can't see you, which is a bummer. We're playing it with it this way to see if it's just a little bit easier to keep, keep it focused on the wine. So I'm going to focus mainly on, you know, Andy talking us through these wines. So you all get to taste them and get a little bit of an introduction. Um, but in the future, maybe we'll do one where we can see each other. We don't know. We're just trying to learn all this new technology. There will be a couple of questions we're going to ask on the poll, which will be kind of fun. So pay attention. If you see a little screen pop up, I'll try to make that function work so you can give us some feedback on what you think about the wines. And there is a chat function, um, but actually a little bit more effective is the Q&A. If you have any specific questions about the wines or anything really about us at Dobbs, um, at the bottom of your screen, there's a little button that says Q&A. And hopefully you could just pop into the question there and I will monitor those and um, prompt Andy with those questions or answer them myself if I can as we go. So a little bit of fun there. Um, so, hey, I'm Gretchen. I'll just get started here. It's 603. We've got 24 people on. So I figured let's get going. Um, so I'm Gretchen Bach. I'm the CEO at the winery. It's a fancy title, which I kind of hate really. I've just, you know, been there for a long time uh, since day one, actually, uh, almost 18 years now. It's kind of funny to think about that and um, what a long ride it's been, but a really great ride. So I'm in my home, I'm here in Newburgh and I'm just enjoying this nice relaxing Monday off, which doesn't happen very often. So I'm joined with Andy, Andy McVeigh, our winemaker. And Andy is also in his home up in Forest Grove hanging out. So he might have his daughter toddling around and my three children might pop in, you never know. So we'll just roll with it. So hope you all are having a great Memorial Day. Hope you got to do something special this weekend. Um, enjoy your time with your family and pay respect and honor to those that um, served our country. And if any veterans are on the call, we want to thank you for your service. So hey, let's let's just get started. Um, I'll just give a quick introduction to myself. If I haven't had a chance to meet you, I, if I could see your faces, I'm so much better at faces than names. I would know who's new, who's not new. But for both of you, uh, people that have been coming around and new people, we welcome you. Um, I, like I said, I've, I've been with the company for 17 years now. And I'm really kind of held almost every position in the cellar, um, almost every position in the winery, I should say, starting in the cellar. Um, and worked my way up through the business uh, end of things. And today I am running this place. It's uh, been a really great long ride. I'm so fortunate to be working alongside Andy McVeigh, our winemaker, who's been working with us for 11 years now, and so many other great employees that we've got. I'm sure you know many of them, probably, probably most commonly in the tasting room with Matt and the crew in there, but we've just got this great team of people. Um, so yeah, I'm just a native Oregonian, been here uh, my whole life. My family are longtime farmers and um, growers of both grapes and hops and all kinds of agricultural products here in Oregon. Um, and I got my taste of the wine industry um, actually through construction, which is kind of funny. My dad actually builds wineries. My mom's side were the farmers. Uh, and when I was going through college, I worked for my dad helping to build wineries, swinging a hammer. And I uh, Worked at Willa Kenzie Winery, actually. That's kind of where I first got my, my interest. And I saw what was happening in that cellar and thought, ooh, I think there's something to be had there in that wine industry. So that really piqued my interest. And I found a way to weave my background of agriculture and family and food and, of course, wine together uh, through this career path. So I found this, this at a really young age. I was, I think, 21, probably, when I first went to work for Joe Dobbs, our founder. Uh, that was in 1999. And I was studying um, both agriculture, business, and Spanish at OSU. And uh, Joe gave me a call one day and I went to work for him. And I worked with him for a couple of years at Willamette Valley Vineyards, did a couple uh, vintages elsewhere, and then came on to Wine by Joe and Dobbs Family Estate in 2003. I was the first employee. So I've really been there from day one. Uh, we've had a really, really amazing path. We started out with very, very um, humble roots. As you probably know, it takes a lot of capital to get a winery started, many, many years of investment before you get to actually share your bottle of wine. And so um, that's something that's kind of unique about our company is that those really humble roots and um, the fact that, that we grew this business um, out of really very little savings. It was just like a really hard, uh, hardworking kind of a business that, you know, that's how we got it going, I guess, was just working really hard. I think of it like the American dream, like work hard and get ahead. And we did it. 
through people like Joe, our founder, myself, and all of our staff that have been hired since. And of course, Andy, who's been doing such a great job for so long. So anyway, I could go on and on, <laughs> but um, really great ride. And we're so thankful to be able to connect with you guys through Dobbs Wines. Um, it's such a great experience, I think you know, when you come to the taste room to get to connect with our staff and really get to experience that very down to earth, you know, great, just comfortable experience you have at the winery. We hope that you always have either, you know, an educational time or a fun time and just meet you where you are. That's really what we're great at at Dobbs. We make amazing wines and our staff, I think, delivers it to you in such a great way. So anyway, um, I'm proud to be here and thankful for this opportunity to get to connect this way with you. Uh, with that, I'd like to introduce Andy really quickly. You probably mostly know Andy McVeigh. He's our head winemaker, of course, for Dobbs. He can tell you his own story, but uh, he's done a lot of great things for us over all of these years as well. And he's going to talk you through these wines. But Andy, just maybe give a quick bit on your background before we dig in deep on the wines. Sure. I went to school, uh, went to college at Oregon State University, originally as a biology major, and found myself doing poorly because I lacked uh, enthusiasm and inspiration for um, uh, the coursework. I really loved the ocean and wanted to pursue marine biology, but I was a little bit overwhelmed by um, all, all the science courses that I was taking. I happened to be taking organic chemistry, calculus, physics, and statistics all at the same time, and it, it, it was a little overwhelming, and I found myself failing, and I met with my academic advisor, and he said that I wasn't any good at science, so I shouldn't do science but I really loved science. I just needed a better, a better path uh, to be following, a better destination to, to, to focus on. And I took stock of what was important uh, in my life. The roots that I came from are based in agriculture. My mom grew up on an 80 acre farm in Banks and she and my dad raised me and my five siblings with a very agriculture based hardworking ethic of you work every day and that's why you sleep well at night and that's why you appreciate your food and every day is about work and when your work is surrounded by family and community, uh, work is always fun. So I've always really valued hard work and I wanted to pursue science because, well, apparently I wasn't very good at it and I needed to get better. So I pursued, science, yeah, I pursued science to help me understand the nuts and bolts of the world, uh, why things work. Um, instead of just how they work. And so science was integral for my a better understanding uh, of the world. And I, those two things were, lacked emotion for me without an artistic expression. And when I went, when I identified those three traits of a career, art, science, and agriculture, I found the conclusion to be wine. It was more of uh, gathering data to draw a conclusion, which is what science is all about. And when I put those three things together, it pointed me in the right direction. And wine has always been a compass for me. A lot of people find themselves, a lot of people who end up in the wine industry find themselves kind of drifting through life, figuring out what they're going to do. And suddenly they have this inspiration that wine uh, has such an emotional pull for them and they end up in the wine industry. And I found that uh, when I wasn't doing so well at life. So um, mm -hmm. I graduated in two. I graduated in 2003 with a degree in food and fermentation science and a minor in chemistry. I, uh, and 2003 was my first commercial harvest. I spent a couple uh, research harvests uh, at OSU and I started at Dobbs County State in 2008 as the cellar master. And it's been a great ride. There's so much variety and diversity and quality in the Dobbs program. It's been rewarding every year. It's really a fantastic place to work. Awesome. Andy, thanks for the great introduction. Um, it looks like we've kind of settled in here at 26 attendees, so I think it's a good time to really kind of dig into these wines. Um, hopefully those of you that are just joining us are, you know, catching up and hearing quickly about our backgrounds, but you haven't missed anything yet. So let's jump into these wines. We've got four wines that um, you all picked up this weekend and hopefully have in front of you to smell and taste with us as we go. Um, I'm just sipping on this rosé myself. This is our 2019 rosé that I'm enjoying. Um, so Andy, I, I, I mean, we've only been making rosé for, I want to say five or six years, something like that, but this rosé is very different. So I'd love for you to talk about the why and what, and how is it different than typical rosé of Pinot Noir that's coming from the Willamette Valley and typical of what we've done in the past. Like, why'd you do something different? Tell us about it. What is it? 
all the above. Yeah. So um, I have a, a, a big curiosity about rosé. And uh, a lot of times in the wine industry, people will ask you, what's your favorite wine? And that's really hard to answer, but I forced myself to come to a, to a consistent answer about what my favorite wine is. And my favorite wine is rosé because it can be made so many different ways from any varietal you want. Uh, so many different methods, so many different styles, so many different growing regions throughout the world. And in 2016, our, was, uh, we, we made the first uh, Dobbs Rosé. So we made a 2016, 2017, and 2018 Rosé of Pinot Noir from Quailhurst Vineyard from the Pomard uh, clone. And they were all great. And we made them a little bit different each year. But generally, the, the style uh, was pretty consistent. And I wanted to reinvent the book on how to make rosé for Dobbs Family Estate. And I really like uh, Rhone uh, style rosés or uh, Provence style rosés or Southern Rhone rosés. I love Willamette Valley Pinot Noir rosés. So in 2019, we got back to basics and made rosé from Pinot Noir Syrah and Grenache in at least five different styles and broke each of those methods down into two different paths and aged them and managed them differently. So there was nine or 10 different components that went into the rosé ultimately, but we learned That's a lot easy, about, right, Andy? yeah, well, <laughs> um, and real quick tangent about that, um, about me making things easy, because I love that. I, I, I challenge myself as like, you could have done it a lot easier. 2016, 2017, 2018 were a lot easier ways to make rosé. But I wanted to um, teach and learn about rosé making by spreading it apart. And it reminds me of how I make uh, stew at home. You know, a lot of winemakers talk about their winemaking roots in the kitchen, that wasn't so much of a passion for me, but I do think about food and food preparation all the time. And a lot of people make stew by throwing a bunch of stuff together and cooking it all kind of at the same time. Stew's supposed to be easy, right? That's not how I make stew. I make stew in a bunch of different components and then I combine them at the end because sometimes the potatoes are too mushy or the carrots are overcooked yeah. or like the mushrooms are too slimy. So I cook all the components of stew separately and then I combine them in at the, at the appropriate time for texture and intensity and flavor. So some of the onions might be, uh, might be caramelized and some of the mushrooms are dry sauteed so they go in at the end and the meat is usually seared and then introduced with the stock later on and that's the way I approached making this rosé. Some of the rosé grapes were dumped or put into a press hole cluster, very gently squeezed. So we got a very lightly colored uh, rosé juice. Some of them were destemmed and then soaked on the skins for 24 hours and then pressed. And we got a much darker expression of rosé. Uh, that was two different approaches for Pinot Noir. And with the Syrah, we whole cluster press the Syrah and de-stem some of it and then pressed it. So we got two different color expressions. Then one container of Syrah, we added 3% whole berries of uh, Syrah grapes back to it. So it was a much uh, darker colored rosé, but we got a carbonic maceration on those whole berries, which is kind of like Beaujolais Nouveau. So it was like really bright and bubble gummy. And the Grenache. Yeah, can show this picture. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for bringing that up, Gretchen. So this is the... Um, the color spread of rosé that we worked with and the Syrah on the far, on the is the darkest one and the Grenache is actually the one on the far on on the other end of the spectrum mm -hmm. the Grenache we whole cluster yeah right there the Grenache we suppressed and it came out looking like the white wine and smelling a lot like Viognier and I think that was incredible to get white wine aromatics out of the red wine we see that with Blanc de Noir styles of uh, yeah, a question at home. If you have rosé in your glass, please uh, jump in there and taste along as we go. Totally. We uh, should have made that clear, actually. Let me just jump in here real quick because we've had some new people attending at, since we've started. A couple of little housekeeping things. First of all, please sip and taste and enjoy as we talk. We're just going to talk through each wine and talk about the why and the how and what we think they taste like. We do have a couple poll questions that we're going to ask you along the way. Um, so be prepared for that. We'll, I'll shoot the first question out here in a minute so we can interact that way. 
And if you have specific questions, push the Q&A button and ask us and I will field those and layer them in so Andy can answer those as we go. Um, I feel like there was one other question, like maybe that's it. So good, good. Yes, sip along, sip along. I'm sipping on mine. <laughs> so we have this uh, big spread of rosé style from pretty much white wine from red grapes to um, a pretty dark version of rosé. And all of them were dry and all of them were fruit, uh, fruit forward and had different levels of concentration. And uh, fortunately and fantastically, the best blend was all of them together. And um, what I'm really pleased about for, for those of you at home who really love 16, 17, and 18 and thought that the wheel, that if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Um, I, I still think that the style turned out elegant and fruit forward and juicy and fresh. Mm, and yeah. uh, this rosé pairs with a lot of different foods very easily. So it's still versatile food pairing wine. And I, I think despite doing all those different things, we still got a, a wine that's consistent in style and quality to the th previous three vintages. So the fourth vintage of Dobbs Rosé, even though it was made completely different, still holds its own as an elegant and fruit forward style of Rosé. I totally agree with that, Andy. It feels like it's got a little bit more kind of weight through the mid palette, a little bit more kind of interest maybe than some Rosés that are a little bit more linear. Do you think that's from some of the different processes you involved, or is it more driven by the varietals that are in it, or was it the, the, the pressing and the fermentation process that you did? Those are, uh, it's kind of yes to all those things. I'm glad that you're bringing up the weight because um, two interesting things about this wine that are different than the previous vintages. It has higher acid than any of the other pre than any of the other vintages, and it has more weight. I think more mid palate body, like. Uh, the, the wine sits in your mouth longer, yeah. even though it's very uh, acid forward and refreshing and mouth watering. And I really like that dynamic of having a higher acid wine with enough body to stand up to it. It makes it a, uh, a more lively, a vibrant mouthfeel. And that extra weight comes particularly from the Syrah and Grenache components. The Pinot Noir Rosé was very uh, moderate alcohol and moderate weight. It has some of the really pretty red fruit uh, aromatics but the weight especially comes from the Grenache, despite not having uh, a lot of color, it had a lot of weight. Mm -hmm. And the Syrah with uh, that 3% whole berry fermentation had a lot of um, li uh, some lively tannins as well. So it's yeah, got, uh, the great flavor of like strawberry rhubarb. I'm thinking of a strawberry rhubarb pie, maybe not the, the pie crust so much, but the fruit in the strawberry rhubarb pie, it's like just totally reminds me of that. But I love the juiciness, like my mouth is just mouth watering and and I'm thinking about what I'd like to go have this with for dinner or, you know, before dinner, maybe. What, what do you, what would you recommend with this food or with this wine, Andy? I like rosé with everything. Um, I particularly yeah. like it with Thanksgiving, I, uh, poultry and rose. I like Thanksgiving dinner pairing with rosé because there's so many different foods on, on the table. So, all right. <laughs> good good yeah, review Diana. from rosé. From, um, so I think, I would go to rosé every time it's a little, when you're wondering what to have with dinner and you think, I, I don't know, should I have red? Should I have white? Just keep a bottle of rosé in the fridge all the time because you're, it's always going to be the solution. And it's going to go great with uh, afternoon or a glass of wine before dinner or a glass of wine after dinner. It's refreshing in both ends. Uh, so I, I know I'm dodging that question a lot, but um, for me, rosé is the answer when you're a little bit confused on, on what to pair. It's, it's mm -hmm. just very flexible. I, I, I call it the, the diplomat of wines because it gets along with everything. Right. And particularly having a diplomatic wine at Thanksgiving is helpful. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I like rosé all the time. I mean, it's, it's such a versatile wine, like you said. I mean, it's often a go-to for me, with, you know, earlier in the afternoon or just on a sunny day, like just by itself. And this, in spite of that higher acid, some wines with that high acid, you're like, ooh, I've got to have some food with this. But uh, this is just juicy and refreshing. And I mean, I could sip this alone all day long, but yet I think it would go well with so many different kinds of foods. So I'm looking at our poll here. We're almost complete, got 72% voted. If anybody doesn't, can't vote or doesn't know how to vote, no worries. But it looks like we've got almost a majority here that are saying afternoon at the pool, I'm with you. That sounds like a great place to drink, to drink this rosé. But you know, with the melon salad, with prosciutto, that's like mm, the fruit and the meat, and the savory together, that'd be delicious. All of it. Oh, that's fine. Well, the right last on. of those, 
while the last of those poll re replies come in, one of the uh, questions and comments in the in the box is uh, the aroma of banana in the wine. I'm uh, Ron. I'm glad you're picking up on that. The banana character is uh, specific to carbonic maceration from whole berries from the Syrah. So that's like a Beaujolais Nouveau or a whole cluster character. And um, yeah, that's distinctly from the Syrah component. Yeah, great question. Uh, I pick up on that. Yeah, and uh, uh, Ron, do you like the banana in, in the aroma? I'll, I'll, I guess I'll wait for the answer because it's going yeah, totally. in by type. But I, I really like banana um, as long as it's subtle because it can be a little bit overwhelming. And certain, uh, the, some of the Syrahs that we did in 2019 that were for red wines have that kind of carbonic, really uh, floral, aromatic to them. And I like it. I think um, it's distinctly more of an aromatic character than um, a flavor. And that's typical of a carbonic maceration. Someone's asking how to answer on the polls. And when I clicked it, I saw I didn't click the option to let people vote. So I was afraid I screwed it up. But most people are able to vote. So I'm not quite sure on the next question, I will make sure I check that box because maybe there's just a little glitch happening there. Um, but it should have popped up, but it might be down the bottom. If you can see on the bottom of your screen, there's a thing that says polls. You might have to click on that. So try that. Um, Andy, I think we should move into Pinot Noir. We've got three Pinots here to taste, and I'm really excited to try these. They're all 2017s. Um, and honestly, I, I tasted these wines quite a bit along the way, but I haven't tasted them like fully finished out of the bottle for quite a while. I've been drinking the Grand Assemblage, um, and now I'm pouring this 2017 Vista Hills. Um, honestly, I haven't drank the Vista Hills a whole lot. I think we've, it's our second single vineyard that we've done from Vista Hills. Um, I think a good place to start because we have three 2017 wines here is to talk about the vintage overall. So we can cover that bit yeah. probably Andy, and then get yeah, into the nuance really of these three wines and the why and the how. Um, yeah. so let's move into this. Right on. Um, and just, just to address, address a question that came in the box. Um, we are recording this and I imagine that we can share it with folks. I think that we can email a link and Amelia, uh, Amelia Dobbs, uh, our superstar behind the scenes on this whole situation, because it's relatively new to me. Uh, Amelia will probably get, be able to get dig down into that for us. So we'll get a question to you, an answer to you soon on whether you can view the video afterwards. Yes, I think uh, it's dependent on me not screwing this up at the end. Amelia told me what to do, so <laughs> I'll do my best. <laughs> Uh, the 2017 vintage is uh, a phenomenal vintage because it is the best of both worlds, a warm growing season followed by a cool harvest. And what made it really um, anxious for winemakers was the transition between the growing season and the harvest season because we had a week of rain the last week of September, similar to 2013. But um, the beautiful thing is in 2017, after that week of rain, we had 17 days of dry, cool weather in October from October 1st to October 17th. It started raining right around the 17th and it was beautiful conditions. So we had that warm growing season, beautiful quality fruit, ripe mature tannins. And then if we hadn't had that week of rain, every, all the Pinot Noir from the Wine Valley really would have come in in about 10 days. Oh, and uh, yeah, it would have been tough. Uh, if you couldn't get it into that window, it probably would have got uh, riper than ideal. And with those 17 days of cool, dry weather in October, everything came in uh, in beautiful condition at um, at a very measured pace. So it was, pace. made it really easy. That High makes, quality. I mean, that's such a dream. We've had so many vintages when I used to work in the cellar that were, you know, compact and just, oh man, is it hard. So what a nice little break Mother Nature gave you here in 17. Yeah. And um, that growing season translates into wines with uh, mature tannins, smooth tannins and wines with bright acid and generally easy fruit forward characters. Sometimes in the cooler vintages that are a little bit more structured or tannic uh, or acidic, you get some more herbaceous characters and those can be really fun. But uh, the warmer vintages generally provide more abundant fruit aromas. And 2017 has uh, that abundant fruit aroma, ripe fruit characters, uh, very red fruit characters from most, most AVAs. So we have smooth tannins, bright fruit forward wines with enough acid to keep them fresh and vibrant as they age. Generally not um, a super tannic wines. They're, the tannins are mature. 
so they're not very astringent. They should be smooth and, and very plush in the mouth. Mm -hmm. um, and it, uh, we'll get into aging a little bit as we talk about each one of these wines. Totally. So, we'll um, cover that beach wine. That's such a great question, and we'll definitely fill those in, which is, I mean, Andy, just, I mean, I guess to cover that topic broadly up front, what are the major things you look at when you're looking at aging a wine? Like, is it acid? Is it like, what are the things you're, when you as a winemaker, you're tasting this, but you have the chemistry in your head too. Like what helps you guide, you know, make your decision on how to guide people about how soon should they drink this wine or how long may it last? Yep. The two things that require aging and uh, sustain aging are acid and tannin. When we're talking about red wines with white wines it's generally acid but you can get tannins in white wines also particularly from barrels but some white varieties are more tannic than others uh with red wines we're talking about acid and tannin tannin is what requires aging because uh young tannin is very astringent and drying and uh it can require food or time to to smooth those tannins out acid is what keeps the wine fresh and vibrant as the as the tannin uh ages so if we were looking at a, a, a plot graph here, the tannin is going down and the acid is staying flat. Okay. And if you have good acid, then the vibrancy stays up there. And, uh, but as the tannin goes down, fresh fruit characters are going down also. So you want to like find a spot where those two things uh, inter, uh, connect. And that spot that magic spot is totally different depending on your preference. And I really like uh, generally younger wines that are a little bit more vibrant and have a little bit more fresh tannin uh, because I like fruit forward wines. And as a wine ages, the fresh fruit characters uh, diminish and the more uh, dried and floral fruit characters come through. You mm -hmm. also get um, some non-fruit complexity like Pinot Noir is classic for forest floor, but also mushroom characters, mm -hmm. which are really fun. That changes food pairing, uh, uh, the food pairing dynamic. You can get into more savory dishes and more subtle dishes uh, and like more dried herbs instead of fresh herbs. So the, the Vista Hills, um, that's a little bit about, about uh, aging. And we've um, put these wine in order of the most ageability. Uh, we have a little bit of <laughs> I know. right on. Well, I realized I yeah. just forgot to share the results with everyone, so I did that. Sorry. Yeah, no <laughs> problem. Well, it looks like we have uh, a good spread of food pairing choices, but it looks like everybody's uh, many people are interested in having it by the pool. <laughs> yeah, I should. I thought I shared that. I'm sorry. I didn't realize it wasn't visible the whole time. Next time I'll share it sooner. <laughs> sorry for the interruption, Andy. <laughs> no problem. Like, um, and with all the questions that come in, I whenever. Um, things come in out of order. I always say my brain isn't very uh, linear. It's kind of erratic. So I can stop and start wherever we need to and get into any topic that uh, you're interested in. Well, let's move into this wine. I'm going to pop this question up right now um, about this Vista Hills, um, but I don't want to interrupt too much, but it's just about like what flavors are you tasting? So we'll let people think about that while you talk about this wine in particular. And I don't know if you want to get into the site or just more about this wine, but you take it from here, Andy. Tell us about this Vista Hills. Right on. Well, we uh, we selected Vista Hills to be the first Pinot Noir out of these three because of its smooth tannins and red fruits. It's a, I think it's a really elegant wine, and it highlights the elegance of the 2000 of the Dundee Hills. Dundee Hills, for me, compared to the other AVAs that we work with, is is more elegant, and by that I mean smoother tannins, uh, acid to match the intensity of the tannins. So sometimes a little bit more moderate acid. Uh, floral tones like rose and mm. pomegranate it's and very red aromatic. Currant. I mean, this is super aromatic. Yeah, want it to be abundantly floral and aromatic and red fruited, mm -hmm. and not a lot of oak to compete with that. I, uh, when we're doing an ABA wine or a single vineyard wine, we want to showcase the personality of, of the growing region and of the site. Mm. So, um, all of this is Vista Hills character from 2017. You mentioned and, oak, Andy. What is the oak regime on this wine? Uh, I want to say 22 percent, which yeah. is pretty moderate. Mm -hmm. I think the, the 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 tasting notes were probably emailed or sent out with the wines, so feel free to. Well, I'm cheating. Me if I'm, wrong. <laughs> I'm cheating, and I'm looking at them. And you're right. Good answer. Okay. Good. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry right I put you on the spot, but I was trying to lead oh, you. Oh no, I'm I I, I like that. 
22% uh, is similar to what the Grand Assembly has been in Juarez for 2017. It's just enough to add complexity without taking away from the fruit. Mm -hmm. And uh, the new oak is going to add a little bit of weight and a little bit of structure, which um, sometimes is needed in uh, Vista Hills. And I think that's great. And it keeps the wine vibrant and fresh. And now we're talking, the question is specifically is about the taste of the wine, right? Not just the aromatics, but what are you tasting in this wine? So talk to us a little bit about what you taste in the wine or what you're getting in your mouth. Yeah. Um, well, I think a lot of the aroma of this wine carries through onto the palate. So totally. uh, cherry, cherry and strawberry and pomegranate, red, red fruits and floral, uh, floral fruits. And I think a lot about floral fruits like loganberry is a really distinctly floral fruit for me. Mm -hmm. And pomegranate is and red currant are. Um, strawberries are coming into in season in the Willamette Valley. So I've been just smelling strawberries at home thinking, yeah, this, oh, this is exactly what strawberry is. I love it. It reminds yeah. me of what red fruit is. And I think Vista Hills has a lot of that. It's a little bit more cherry driven for me than strawberry. Mm -hmm. And the flavors are smooth and juicy and the tannin is uh, moderate. This wine is great as a young wine. I think it'll uh, improve with time without a problem. It's still young. We're just releasing it. So um, it'll hold up with time, but it'd be great to watch this wine uh, every six months or so over the next three years. Yeah. Uh, that'd be a great window to be watching Vista Hills from 2017. Because I think this is beautiful right now. I mean, I, I think this is ready to serve for dinner tonight. Like it's ready to drink, but it feels like it's going to have quite a life in it, right? I mean, it's very fruity so maybe that will change like you said over time and maybe some of that fruit will diminish but it's got a nice asset i think it's going to hang out like would you say five years ten years i mean I, you had to guess seven somewhere in the yeah <laughs> um uh, yeah, and when uh, aging wine, the question of how long to age wine is really a personal choice. Uh, if you like super smooth wines with less uh, fresh fruit character, mm -hmm. then aging them longer uh, is good. And like five or more years would definitely get that this wine into that super smooth with, with less uh, uh, fruit character, less okay. fresh fruit character. And... I think over the next three years, this wine will be really dynamic and a really great drinking window. And beyond that, we'll get into some of those more aged uh, characters and um, the tannins will soften out more and the, the acid will show through more, more as, as, the, as the tannins go away. One of the questions. Tracy, yeah, I was going to say, Tracy has yeah. a question about the site and the elevation. And of course, I know Vista Hills Vineyard pretty well. It, it is pretty close to the top of the hill there, right? I mean, it's. Yeah. Over on Raymond Orchard's Road, so not up Warden Hill Road, right up from the winery, but kind of the next main highway over, if you will, the main road, country road. But um, yeah. I don't know the exact elevation, Andy, do you? And, you know, how did that affect the character? Yeah, it's a high elevation. And for, for the Dundee Hills, that means like around 800 feet. For me, there is spots in the Dundee Hills that can get up to 1,000 feet, but they're, they're more rare. Vista Hills is um, what formerly known as Vista Hills, now Domain Broy, uh, owned by Coppola. Vista Hills is adjacent to uh, the Domain Serene vineyard, just downhill from there, and it's around 800 feet, but it goes down to the low 700s, and the blocks we get are pretty consistently in the same elevation, right around uh, 750 feet or so. And that site, because the the elevation kind of starts leveling out there and it's at a full exposure spot. So it tends to be a warm site. And then that warm growing season is 2017. Uh, Vista Hills got ripe and, and needed to be picked in a really small window. And these uh, classic Oregon viticulture is putting grapes in the warmest site possible. And in warm vintages, they have a really small picking window. Uh, so, um, that's the pro and con of a warm site in a warm vintage that you got to get in there right when the right when they get good. Unfortunately, I think we nailed that window beautifully. Uh, yeah. 2017 has uh, all that all that ripe uh, red fruit aroma is is um, is, a, is a result of that. So high elevation vineyard, uh, south facing slopes. It's two clones, 114 and 777. Because they are blend, I don't really get into the clone personality here. Not a lot of oak, so the the terroir is showing through. The culture right. of the site is showing through, and um, just like pristine condition fruit, it was beautiful to work with. Awesome, that's great. And it looks like the audience is pretty much agreeing. Eighty percent of the folks saying that they really are tasting that dark cherry component in it, which I think is very prominent as well. 
Um, second would be tobacco, which is the tobacco and cedar, even a spicy vanilla, that would be more coming from the barrels, right, Andy, versus the fruit. It sounds like yeah. the fruit is really dominant, and then those barrel components or what are those tertiary um, components coming in, right, Andy? I'm studying my W set. I'm trying to get this down. <laughs> oh, yeah, right on. Yeah. Yeah, um, I'm glad that uh, that the fruit, the red fruit is showing is clearly. Uh, tobacco is a character that can come from uh, barrels or whole cluster and sometimes stems. Oh. And some some AVAs and vineyards are a little bit more herbaceous and get tobacco just from the character of the vineyard, like Mumtazia is that way. That's and right. Dupi can be, the McMindill AVA can be like that. The Eola Amity Hills AVA can be that like that it generally comes from a cooler sites uh, with more wind exposure. But did you do any whole cluster in this wine or not? No, and I try to avoid that with single vineyard wines and AVA wines because it takes away from a whole cluster. You can, whole cluster can really, you can turn it to 11. And it, mm -hmm. um, although the stems are from the vineyard and from, uh, that's part of the terroir, but it really changes the personality of a wine. So I usually use that in blends that are not AVA or single vineyard specific. Or if I use them in one of those um, terroir driven wines, it's at a small percent, like less than 7%. Got it. So no whole cluster in Vista Hills. So I'm looking at the clock. We better move into Patricia's. So we've got two wines to go and we've got just under 20 minutes. So let's pour this 2017 Patricia's Cuvée. Love this black label. Oh. It's always been one of my favorites. And, uh, you know, Patricia's uh, is a wine that we've been making really even before it was called Patricia's Cuvée. It was called Cuvée Noir for a long, long time for those of you that have been club members forever. Um, maybe the first five, six, seven years, this wine was the black label and called Coupe Noir, like the black blend, if you will. Um, it was kind of like, you know, a sexy dark black label that we really thought, you know, was a showpiece. Um, after Joe Mary Patricia, he wanted to make a, a, the wine, a wine in honor of her. As you know, we have the wine that's um, in Amelia's namesake or crafted for Amelia. Um, which is the Emily Rose Cuvée, it used to be called Skippers. That was her nickname when she was a kid. Um, and then we have the Griffin's Cuvée, which is in honor of Joe's son, Griffin. And so when Joe married Patricia, he you know, wanted to do the same for his wife. So this is really what we call the family trio with Patricia's, the Emilia's, and the Griffin's. Um, again, that used to be the Cuvée Noir, but it's always been, regardless of the name, our Willamette Valley blend. Um, as you know, probably at Dobbs, we have our Grand Assemblage, our flagship, you know, wine that we hope everyone's drinking all the time. It's a great price, great quality. Our next tier are the family tier of wines that I'm just describing now, which are all, well, I guess not the Amelia's. They they kind of blends, but Amelia's is a single vineyard. Uh, it used to be, but the okay. AVA series comes before the family cuvées. Right. Okay. Oh, you're right. Yep. And we add those later. But then we've got our single vineyards. That's what I was trying to touch on is we've got the single vineyards that are just coming from one sure. site. So we have one site and then we have blends where the winemaker really gets to get your fingers involved and pull from various sites within a given ABA to put together components that you know just meld really well together to give us the complexity we're looking for so um patricia's cuvee has the constant what i was trying to get to is that it's always been a Willamette valley blend um and um just a blend that kind of hits on all fronts in all ways so andy can get in the details there um yeah tell us about it andy yeah the family cuvées are what i call personality wines we can have a personality that comes from a single vineyard or an ava but you can have a personality of a person as well and these are winemakers cuvées so uh, we get to pull from a bunch of different uh, locations, like Gretchen said, and they rep and through that blending, we get consistency. And every vintage, Patricia's is supposed to be an opulently styled Pinot Noir. Opulent is um, probably is a little bit subjective, depending on what your experience in life is. But from a winemaker's point of view, opulent means a lot of everything yeah. and uh, a lot of fruit. So you can have a lot of oak. A lot of structure for aging, but a lot of plush body for so the wine is enjoyable to drink while it's young. Uh, quite a bit of acid to keep your mouth watering to combat those tannins. So it's got to be a lot of everything. I think that's what opulence is. Mm -hmm. And uh, so many folks come in to the tasting room and try. We make ten different styles of Pinot Noir for Dobbs Family Estate, and um, frequently we hear people 
taste through those Pinots and they leave saying Patricia's is what I think of when I think of Oregon Pinot Noir as like a, a broad brushstroke like Willamette Valley, beautiful world-class Pinot Noir. So, um, wow. Yeah, a, a lot of everything. It's got to please everybody. And yeah. um, from a winemaker's, from Joe's point of view, if he's going to make a wine named after his wife, it's uh, you're a, a, a an individual spouse means everything to them. So you have to, it has to play on so many different levels. And uh, I think that's, that's um, a tall order to fulfill. <laughs> I go to blend Patricia. I have to um, totally. maintain, maintain that uh, um, super high quality that Joe, that the standards that Joe set. So this wine is um, amazing. I'm, I mean, I'm just smelling yeah. it. It's like, it's just coming out of my glass, this aroma. And then I, I you know, of course, I'm sipping on it now, and it's just got so much complexity, Andy. I'm really impressed with it. Tell us about what sites it's come from, or what what is making this so you know opulent in all the ways. What have you done with this wine? Yeah, um, well, sometimes I can find the same personality in a bunch of different sites and put all those things together. It's like, oh, I love this, I love this, I love this. They're all the same color spectrum I'll throw them together and other times I find structure from one vineyard dark fruit from one vineyard floral components from another vineyard oak from a different vineyard and in 2017 it's a little bit more of that where Jean Ray uh, is 40 percent of this wine and it's more red fruited but like plush strawberry components and then 30 percent of the wine is open claim vineyard and it's the 943 clone uh, club members who remember the 2016 vintage, our 30th harvest, uh, Pinot, uh, we did a single barrel release and sold it all in futures, but that was a 943 clone aged in a new oak barrel. So if you have some of that 30th harvest Pinot, 30% of that wine, 30% of this wine is from that block, 943. 943 is distinct because it has little berries and big berries and all the concentration of little berries provide superpower uh, and uh, the big berries are really plush and uh, ripe characters. So that intensity uh, of red fruit and tannin and concentration is 30% of this wine. And 20% is the Yola Springs Vineyard. There we go, you're back. <laughs> I'm tasting, I'm getting it. My mouth feels like velvet right now. It's like this is beautiful texture in my mouth you know it's got just juiciness too but like there's the texture and the flavor just kind of keeps lingering and he's having technical issues uh yeah my battery's low um uh -oh. well uh i got it plugged in just had to take okay. the headset so uh juicy and intense mm. those were some and of the, the, the velvet the velvety feeling those the tannins in my mouth and you're just like beautiful like not not too astringent not too strong just feels very um very well balanced overall i love it right on and that's that's a lot of what opulence is it about is uh, smooth and silky and powerful and air, air, aromatically intense uh open claim is a lot about that gene ray runs the core of this wine, Eola Springs, which is about 50% of our Eola Amity Cuvée, is 20% of this wine, and Simonet Single Vineyard Fruit is 10% of it. So all of those things are providing in order of Jean Ray, Open Claim, Eola Springs, Simonet. Jean Ray is like right down the middle, solid, plush, juicy fruits, smooth tannins. Open Claim is intensity and floral aromatics. Eola Springs is darker fruits like Marion Berry and dark cherry. And Simonet is kind of like high tone floral aromatics with like some really um, pristine acidity down the middle. Mm -hmm. So all of those things. And at 45% new oak, this wine has enough oak to, to layer in complexity. It's not just boosting the fruit, but it's, it's uh, adding more interest to the wine. And because we're not emphasizing an ABA or a single vineyard here, I think 44% is not a problem. It's making the wine more complex, more opulent. Andy, Tracy is saying that she's getting a fair amount of vanilla. Do you think that's coming from the barrels or is there anything else that would come from? Yeah, vanilla comes from the oak. Earlier, uh, tobacco could be coming from a vineyard source or a whole cluster source or, or a barrel mm -hmm. source, but vanilla is distinctly from, from, barrels. from lo lower toast barrels. Mm -hmm. from Got the it. Oak. Great right question. On. Yeah, very good. And let's talk about longevity and aging this wine to fulfill that question. We promised we'd answer that with every Every wine we taste, how long would you lay this wine down? I mean, I'm drinking it right now. I think it's beautiful right now, just like the Vista Hills. So now until, you're gonna give us the same general answer, I understand, but like anything different 
Um, yeah, Be because of uh, the higher percentage of new oak here and a little bit, it's a more intense wine, a more opulent wine, a more um, uh, dense wine, I think, uh, mm -hmm. where I think Vista Hills is going to be great. For my preference, I'm going to follow Vista Hills over the next three years. And beyond that, I would start seeing um, uh, more tertiary characters or Venice yeah. characters of dried fruit and more earthy characters. Patricia's, I think, is going to be hold nicely for the next five years, and then we'll get into more aged characters um, for, for me. So we're getting an extra two years from opulence in this situation from my point of right view. Right on. And Andy, Jessica's asking, like, how long, you know, after from the time you open it, how long should you wait before you serve it? And I'll just say that I barely open my bottles. It's 648 now, so about one hour ago. Um, I cracked those corks right then, and, and I, I didn't install this wine until now, but it's, it is just open and beautiful, and I'm surprised. Sometimes it takes wines a little while, um, so that's great. Um, you can answer the question, but I'm just going to say, like, what if, what like, how will it be tomorrow? Can I put the cork in it tonight, and tomorrow will be fine? And yeah, so I think that's a, great, that. that's a great question, and um, we'll get a little bit technical uh, as briefly as I can be, <laughs> as my nerdy self can be. Um, Gretchen just opened her bottle. But the samples that you all at home have taken home were opened on Thursday and we filled those little bottles and we did it in a way so they picked up very little air. So it's not like decanting into a decanter where you splash it and had a lot of air. It was very moderately exposed to air, like very little. So they should still be very fresh, but they've been in the bottle for three or four days easy now. So if they still are fresh, that will suggest to you that this wine is pretty intense. It can hold up. And young wines can hold up over several days. Uh, with, with the 2017 at this stage, I could see like opening up an hour before you want to drink it. And then um, if you had a partial bottle that you left open, I could see it holding for two or three days. Mm -hmm. And then as a wine gets older, that window gets smaller. And that really depends on the style of wine and the vintage also. If we're talking about 2011, that window opens up longer. And 2017, it's a little, it's a little smaller. Um, because if you have more more acid and more tannin, the wine will be more resistant to oxidation and and uh, um, uh, getting worn out. So if these 2017s are showing great right out of the bottle, I think that they're wines that you don't need to wait to open up. But if they they seem a little bit restrained, it's great to test your your own preferences on how long you want that uh, window how long you want to watch the window, watch the wine develop. But I think an hour before dinner for these young wines is good. And you could watch them um, uh, evolve over three days if you wanted mm -hmm. to have the bottle open. That's not That's a problem awesome. with young wines. With young wines, it's very flexible. So it looks like almost everyone on the call has had Patricia's before, which is amazing. And many people touched in and said that Patricia's is the reason they joined the club. Um, that's great. I mean, it's been one of the, it's like I said in the beginning, it's a wine we've made since, whoo, I have to remember, we made Amelia, the Skipper's Cuvée was our very first wine that we made from 2001 Vintage. Um, and we layered in the Cuvée Noir, I think about 2003, 2004. And then again, the name changed to Patricia, but the same style and intention of this wine has been there from, from a lot of years. So, no question a lot of people have been exposed to it as a favorite in our tasting we've been pouring it for a lot of years so that's great to hear that most people have had it um and a couple people that haven't had it again haven't had it yet that will never happen again i love that that's great so definitely enjoy this wine and hope you you know get it again um and andy somebody wants to know why are you drinking with us tonight i thought about typing in the answer but best for you to answer yeah, um, i'm drinking water from my favorite iris cup tonight um i uh we are in the midst of blending 2019 Pinot Noirs for Dodge Family Estate, and my mouth is just torn apart. So I'm in recovery mode. I tasted wine for about two hours today. And as often as people say, winemaking must be so wonderful, you get to taste wine all day, right? Like it's very tiring on my palate and my gums are kind of like uh, pretty worn out and sore and so is my tongue. So. I'm gonna it's drink a rough beer. life. I mean, it's a rough life. Who? We the yeah. poll question. Who feels sorry for Andy? <laughs> Just kidding. I'll get better. Right I'm on. not complaining. But I'm not complaining, but I'm drinking water. And I love it. The question. 
there's a question <laughs> there's a question about decanting wine to open it up yeah you can shake the heck out of it there's this great video on youtube about the australian way to decant wine and they uh um take the screw cap off and they pour a glass out yeah. and they just put the screw cap back on and they shake the heck out of the bottle and then they put the glass back in and they say that's the australian way to decant so yeah the more you aerate the wine the more it'll open up um <laughs> uh <laughs> thanks carly i appreciate that um so, uh so yeah, you can aerate it. One of my favorite uh, decanters at home is a mason jar because I can screw the lid back on and shake the heck out of it. And then I can pour it in mason jars or a dime a dozen. Uh, I don't, I'm not so worried if I break it and they're very sturdy when they tip over in the sink. So yeah, you can decant and aerate to help a wine open up more. Right on. Okay, Andy, I'm going to keep you on track. We got seven minutes and we could probably talk for two more hours, but I'm sure people have things to get to. I want to make sure we have time to talk about the 2017 McMinnville Cuvée. Again, this is the ABA oh. series. Andy caught me because I moved right into the family wines and then the single vineyard wines. But a couple of years ago, we launched this new line of wines. Um, they're all in this gray label. And we call them the ABA series. Um, we have a wine club kind of structured around it called our Essentials Club. And we think these should be essentials in your cupboards at home, right? Because they're really coachable price points and beautiful wines. And they're all um, a blend of at least two or more sites from some of the smaller sub ABAs here within the Willamette Valley. So this is the 2017 McMinnville um, Cuvée, and it's a blend of two different sites, right, Andy, from the Mac AVA. So please tell us about this wine in seven minutes or less. <laughs> the 2017 McMinnville Cuvée is 70% Montazi, which is, has been a single vineyard of ours. We released a single vineyard Montazi in 2018, so something for you all to look forward to. Uh, so 70% of the wine is Montazi, 30% is Dupi. I mentioned the 943 clone earlier, the 30% from Dupi is 943, so you get all that concentration. The McMinnville ABA is, for me, is known for concentration, high acid, high tannin, dark fruits, intensity, all that, and sometimes herbaceous, briary, uh, brambly characters that make great non-fruit complexity. So it's not, it's really easy to make fruit forward Pinot Noir. It's hard to make it uh, complex and spicy, and McMinnville ABA does that innately. So because of that spicy intensity and all that um, character, um, the... Uh, 2017 McMinnville Cuvée doesn't have any new oak, so I think that's fantastic when a wine can stand on its own with uh, non-fruit complexity without whole cluster, without new oak. There's tons of beautiful spiciness to this wine and dark fruit and intensity, and it should be the most acidic of these three Pinot Noirs, uh, and that will help it age and let those tannins resolve and keep it fresh and vibrant. It also makes the food pairing um, choices a little bit more specific. Generally with higher acid wines, I look for uh, foods that have a little bit more fat to them, a little bit more uh, intensity or weight to them. Uh, so like cream of mushroom soup, I think is great. Um, a marbled piece of red meat that's grilled is really good. Uh, grilled vegetables, I think are fantastic. So a little bit more intense flavors and a little bit more fat or richness to your food is a great way to stand up to the acid in a wine like the McMinnville Cuvée. I'm swishing fast so I can talk. I'm trying to wrap this up. <laughs> or trying to like drink in time. But man, Andy, I stuck my nose in this glass and it's like I immediately had this very darker fruit aromas. I mean, Maryberry, I mean, native Oregonian, been eating Maryberry since I was a baby girl, right? So it's like this darker, like I'm thinking a little bit, not stewed, but like warm Maryberry sauce or something like that over a pie like that's what's coming to mind with me is really beautiful aroma wow yeah love McMinnville, it our McMinnville ABA years are still fun to work with because uh you're tasting through we had 55 different Pinot Noir lots to go through in 2019 and going through them all getting like the Cheyenne Mount ABA personality and the Dundee Hills personality and the Yola Spring Yola Amity personality and then getting into the McMinnville ABA personality it's like just totally shifts gears and it's amazing it's, I, I mean think, it's like 20 minutes from the Dundee Hills 15 minutes from the Yola Amity or Yola Amity Hills so close yet so different that's amazing same vintage same winemaker barrels what about the barrels I mean are they very different 
Um, yeah, there's no new oak for this wine because all the intensity from the vineyard personality. Part of that is the 943 clone from Dupuy. It's like very dark fruited, um, even more so from that vineyard. Um, and all neutral oak for this. Uh, and by neutral, I mean four fills or more. So really the wine wow. is standing on its own. I think um, so much of the intensity from the McMinnville ABA comes from the Van Duzer Corridor which is a gap in the coast range around Lincoln City that funnels cool ocean air into the Willamette Valley on, during hot summer days. And it grazes the southern exposure of the McMinnville AVA. Gets, um, it cools things down. And generally, grapes that come from windy uh, climates have thicker skins, and that increases concentration and tannin. The acidity comes from a cool growing region, and the McMinnville AVA is more cool because of its exposure to the winds. The Dundee Hills are protected from those winds, and, they're, and the Dundee Hills vineyards are uh, planted in classic warm spots, generally high elevation, south facing slope. And the McMinnville AVA is a little bit more, um, especially the Mumtazi vineyard is planted at a tons of different exposures, and it's a cool area. Uh, so it holds the acid, it has thicker skin, so it gets more concentration. I think it's fantastic. It's amazing. I mean, I'm really, I mean, I've been in this business for 20 years now, Andy, but like, I don't have the opportunity to sit here and talk about wines with you very often and taste, you know, these wines and just hear the details. And I would say, once again, I'm blown away with same vintage, same winery, you know, similar, you know, you have your range of coopers you work with, the barrel makers, you know, they're all going to, of course, vary in, in toast levels, all those things, but the uniqueness really is coming from the sites, and I think that's really something you're letting shine through in these wines, because these wines are very different from one another, and I think that's amazing. I love to just, like, understand what is that terroir we're enjoying here in our glass, and what is the real difference, because they're right down the road from each other, yet so different. That's so cool, and of course, you've got your tools with barrels, and you can more new up, less new up, toast levels, all those things, but really, it's it's the fruit, it's what Mother Nature gave us and how you're working with that and how you're bringing that all together. That's amazing. And I'm looking at yeah. the poll results here. I'm going to end this poll and let you guys see the results because I think this is really cool. Pretty similar spread, right? Like, love it all. Dark fruit aromas. That's what I got at first was the, the, the aroma on it was such that dark fruit just stood out. But right behind it is the, um, you know, fruit and herbal spice palette. That's, yeah, the tag structure. Yeah, I think it's all, yeah nicely balanced and that's beautiful nice job andy those are some great wines thank you thank you this has been a lot of fun we've had a couple comments of folks um moving on to dinner or their other evening activities and it's really reassuring to hear that you guys uh that we've got some positive response and folks who have a hard time to get out to the winery i miss so many of you currently at the winery but over the years um, there's some folks that just can't come out uh, because they always have some sort of uh, home complication. And I'm really glad that uh, we can see a silver lining of our social restrictions right now to find a new way to reach out to you and uh, still be able to um, share some time with our extended family. Totally. I totally agree with you. Um, I echo everything Andy said and just thankful to have this opportunity to connect with you guys. Looking forward to being there at the next Wine Club event or whenever that time comes again. So, yeah, I hope you guys had a great Memorial Day and a great weekend and a nice four-day week ahead, which will be kind of a nice, you know, quick move. I'm looking at these questions. It sounds like everybody's really loving it. Once they did it again, that's great. Yeah, happy to have, you know, the use of technology to find a way to connect. And, Andy, of course, thank you for making great wine. So we have something to talk about. It's like a distraction from all this stuff you're hearing on the news these days. Looks like there's no other sure. questions. Let me wrap up. Oh, sorry, Andy, before you can have some final words here, but we've almost got almost 95% of people voted. So let's get the results out to see the favorites. Hang on. Oh, oh, um, there we go. The Mac Cuvée. Are you seeing it? Yeah, yeah, you bet. McMinnville Cuvée, 35%, and right behind it. What? Patricia is a, people dropped off the call. I'm surprised. I think Patricia is my favorite. I'm surprised to see these results. I'm like, somebody's not voting. This can't be fair. <laughs> That's great. Well, uh, oh, because I, three people like them all. Right on. Uh, well, yeah. I think uh, Patricia's Cuvée uh, is going to come back around uh, uh, with a little bit more time. And that makes sense uh, considering uh, it opulence is sometimes uh, intensity and, and that'll come around. I'm glad to see 
uh, so many people, there's a pretty even spread in the, the top uh, rankings also. So uh, I, like, I like that there's a lot of diversity within these wines. I wanted to mention a couple things because we haven't had any comments about the two, or questions about the 2019 vintage. But uh, before we, st uh, before I shift quickly and briefly into that, I wanted to say that um, all these wines, if you're liking them and wanted to get more, we have a 25% discount code uh, when you order online, and that uh, is friend25, all in, in all caps. Friend. It's the promo code. Five is our promo code. Promo code so, friend25. Uh, I'm not a good salesperson, but um, I'll give you a pitch in case you're interested in getting more of those wines. And generally, we get a question of, and uh, there, there should be an email coming out or some other reminder about that, just in case you missed the call or draw, um, moved on to other things this evening. Um, and generally, we get a question about how the how the, the previous vintages or how the upcoming vintages. And 2019 is fantastic, wonderful quality. Um, wines uh, that are still have really great ripe fruit intensity with more moderate alcohols uh, and elegant acid. They're beautiful wines, low, generally lower in alcohol. We didn't really get past much past 13.5 in 2019, but um, really nicely balanced wines considering uh, cooler harvest and uh, cooler transition into harvest. And the 2020 vintage, of course, is just starting, but um, all signs point to really good progress. We had bud break in the middle, the kind of um, early, mid-April, so later than 2015 and 2016, uh, but earlier than 2018 and 2019. So it'll be an interesting kind of hybrid start to the vintage. But coming right around the corner here, um, kind of early-ish mid-June, we should step into bloom. So we'll probably have some social media updates on when we get into bloom. And shortly after bloom, like early July, we'll be able to start seeing what uh, fruit set and clusters we have going into the 2020 vintage. So really exciting transition into another seasonal stage of uh, the growing season um, this year. So uh, keep an eye out for that. I just wanted to say one last thing. Uh, Lindsay, one of our members, is saying that, you know, with young kids at home and busy weekend jobs that they have, that she's loving these viral or today's way of connecting um, virtually. So we will keep these up. This is a great learning of COVID-19. It's been a hard time and challenging in so many ways, but it's a great way to connect with people that either can't make it on the weekends of events or, um, you know, live out of state. So we'll find our best way to connect again and uh, share the wines that we're releasing to you and teach all about them and taste them with you and enjoy them. So this is great. It's a positive outcome of this storm situation we're in. Yeah, and this has been a really good, slightly uh, over an hour event for me. Uh, I miss seeing you all uh, at the winery and I really appreciate your time this evening uh, through potentially your dinner hour uh, and time with family at home. So uh, the, that you all signed up and uh, listened to us and participated with uh, Gretchen and I this evening, I really, I, it uh, means a lot to me and I'm sure it does to Gretchen as well. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for your evening. Thank you for your hour. Go enjoy your wines, crack up with those bottles whenever you want and they're gonna be good for today for, for quite a while. So thank you for your time and Happy Memorial Day. Take care. Yeah. Cheers, Bye. everybody. Bye-bye. Oh, that's a huge oh.